Um, again, like the previous panel, uh, I wanted to uh, kind of skip over the bio that you can read in the um, uh, program and again just give a kind of a personal introduction to Jose Gonzalez. Uh, the first time that I saw Jose, I was at my uh, computer screen uh, last year and I was listening to a, um, uh, a committee talk about state parks. And if you've ever listened to a committee on state parks, which I'm sure all of you have religiously, um, there, there's a lot of uh, testimony that comes up about how you know parks are beautiful, parks are great for um, recreation purposes, they provide our trees, they're saving the environment, they're a place for our kids. And, and it's a lot of stuff that you would typically hear about parks. And then someone comes up, and, and I'm not really looking at the screen, but I hear someone talking about how parks are a cultural connection for, for the, this a particular community, how parks are ingrained in the culture of uh, the Latino community, and not only in California, but in, in others as well. And it really resonated, it struck a chord, and it, it really popped my head up from my desk, and I look at the screen, and, and there I see this gentleman, and, and all I can think to myself is, this guy is good. <laughs> and uh, uh, it just so happened that two weeks later, our executive director, Cindy Blaine, had enrolled us in a, uh, our staff in a, in a private cultural competency course. And uh, I really didn't know much about it except that when we walked into the room, there was this guy that I saw in uh, Assembly Parks and Wildlife a few couple weeks ago giving this amazing testimony about tying culture and outdoors and recreation and heritage and culture all together. And I just thought to myself, we got the right guy. Well, we got the right guy uh, so much so that he ended up becoming a board member. I'm really, really excited to introduce him. Uh, there's his topic, and please, a warm round of applause for Jose Gonzalez. <laughs> Thanks for that, Jack. All right, I think this is on. Great. So hopefully I'll be able to shave some time as well, because I'm trying to keep it pithy and to the point. Um, I'm here in capacity as a California Relief Board member, also as a member of the Green 2.0 uh, Working Group, and then there's a bunch of other places where I get to share my voice. But I believe earlier today, Cindy asked um, how many of you had heard about Green 2.0 or the diversity report that they had done. And I understand only a few hands uh, went up. So I'm going to similarly ask you to challenge yourself a little bit, and if you're uncomfortable, that's okay. Um, if you identify as a person of color, if you identify as a person of color, please proudly uh, lift up your hand. Good. So that's a nice visual to say that the representation here is not uh, bad, but I want to compare that to the different spaces when you look at the landscape over the whole kind of quote-unquote conservation field. And uh, as Chuck mentioned, first of all, I feel a privilege to be able to be here because I always consider myself to be a voice uh, for my community, not the voice. That's an important distinction because often what we do is, um, and a lot of times unconsciously think, oh, there is our brown person that is, you know, that's it. We got him. We got her. And before you know it, this person gets to be visible in a lot of spaces, but then they also are given a lot of the weight and responsibility as if that individual now gets to speak for everybody. And so the work here is to try to balance that responsibility with your responsibility of providing the support so that that platform is broadened. And I want you to, con to make sure you're consciously connecting everything we have been saying that I'm gonna to mention to everything that's been said today, that this question about diversity isn't just like, oh, this is the diversity hour now, but that through everything that you have done, it is present and integrated. If it's hiring, how is it visible? Are you fundraising, how is it visible? Are you working with volunteers, how is it visible? Are you um, setting up a pr program, how is it visible? Because that's the whole point about integrating so you do not just something that you attended or thought about. Right? So first question I'm going to pose to you, um, and I'll use the traditional <laughs> clapper to kind of ask for your attention back, but just take a very quick one to two minutes, turn to someone next to you, behind you or in front of you, and see how, would, how do you understand and how would you define the ideas, the words, the concepts of diversity, equity, and inclusion. So DEI. 
And that's just one snapshot. We're not even getting into questions of privilege and cultural relevancy, cultural responsiveness, like all of that. I don't want you to feel rats are being tested, all right? Or what if I don't know? What if it's right? You have to start with your understanding. Because what I'm going to talk about Green 2.0 is looking at the numbers. And the numbers is a snapshot of you. <laughs> so anything, any change that's going to come out of that is going to come from you. And so you have to start with understanding. So diversity, equity, and inclusion. Are you familiar with the words? Do you understand them? How do you define them? Are they all the same? What's, what are the key differences between those? Um, and we'll take it from there. Okay? So diversity, equity, inclusion. Turn to a partner and see um, how you define those. All right, so go ahead and finish that thought. In this work and in this field, to be honest, dialogue is one of the most important tools. If you are afraid to talk about it, it's really difficult to get any action and movement. And that usually tends to be what paralyzes us. How you talk about it is important, and obviously this isn't a workshop to go through all the details at it, but to be able to even understand um, your level of understanding around it, but also your level of, of feeling apprehension or inaction, those are important. Because you have to understand that regardless of your background, uh, if we're not able to even be open about the topic, nothing gets done. Because you always, and that inaction, benefits the system that's already in place. So that just means that things won't automatically get better. So this report came out of um, my alma mater, actually, University of Michigan, School of Natural Resources and the Environment. One of my professors, Rosita Taylor, was contracted to do this review of 74 governmental environmental agencies and 28 leading environmental grant-making foundations. Um, and then also interviewing 21 environmental leaders. So it's one of the most comprehensive reports to just basically find out what are the numbers. And I only have five slides to show you, so you can really try to understand what are the key findings of this report. Simply put, it's this idea of a green insider's club. And that isn't meant to just basically say, here you go, feel guilty, feel bad about it. But rather, it's really trying to say, what is the infrastructure that we have set up that is going to benefit a certain set of relationships and demographics? And you can be saying and asking, we should do something about diversity, or we should do something around equity and inclusion. But the system is set up in such a way that unless you actually do something about it, it's not going to change. So number one is this idea of the green uh, ceiling, that even though the demographics have shifted, they're going to continue to shift. No surprise, by 2042-ish is when we're going to become this, this proverbial minority-majority nation. Uh, in many states, so California here, you already know, Latinos are the largest plurality. 
right? Uh, and that has effects on a lot of spaces, not just who we serve, but also in the, you know, when you go to the Capitol, who is the Senate leader? Who is the Assembly leader? How does their lived experience inform the decision-making um, that's at their table and what you're asking? Because I think some of you have known already that they have bluntly asked you, how is this serving the communities where I come from? And if you're thinking, well, what does that mean? Or why does that matter? It's like, that's the kind of distinction uh, that you need to keep in mind. Unconscious bias, discrimination, and insular recruiting. This came up earlier on the um, recruitment, right? And that can be very difficult if you simply are unaware or don't understand. What you consider normative, normal for you, you have to understand that someone that has a different lived experience will not get um, to have the same access as you. And I can give you, I mean, a case study of one, which is myself. I've often said, I've said this a few times, that I myself applied to work for a conservation organization. And I didn't, and I didn't even hear a word back. Not a peep. Not even, hey, we've actually we reviewed your application and we've decided to go with another qualified applicant. Like, that lets me know, got it. I'm not a good fit or whatever. Nothing. Uh, the irony is that after then starting Latino Outdoors, a few months afterwards, I get contacted by a consultant for the same organization asking me to help them do the very job that I applied for. Um, and so, I, I know it, 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 it's, it's funny, but it's like I told the consultant so over this, you know, I think it was like four months, I said, I didn't learn any new languages. I didn't, my IQ didn't go up by 20 points. Uh, I didn't get any extra degrees. I'm the very same person with, this, with the very same qualifications and applications. So what happened? Was it on me that you felt I didn't uh, put the application properly? Was it that whoever, you know, the, the system that you have in place filtered me out for whatever reason that I don't know? And so that, I said that disconnect is very important because you are asking now for my help after I actually wanted to work for you. So earlier you heard about that disconnect between um, qualified applicants versus how come they're not applying. Right? So that's important to understand how does that work. And there's plenty of research that you can find online, even something as simple as um, how a name is spelled and people change their names and all of a sudden you get more calls back. That doesn't, remember, you have to understand the difference here between unconscious bias, you, it may not be conscious, and no one's saying you are deliberately being racist or prejudiced, but the institution itself is set up in such a way that privilege is afforded um, to, diff to, to other relationships than the applicants you're looking for. And then lastly, the lackluster effort and disinterest in addressing diversity. This is the, one of the biggest gaps the gaps between saying it's important to us, but then will you actually do something about it? And in terms of just looking at percentages, what was found is that there's an impression that there's low numbers of people of color in the applicant pool, um, but that means that it's, the question again goes to, when we, even with my work when we say, why don't Latinos care about the outdoors or nature? I said, well, flip the question and say, do you know how Latinos actually care about uh, the outdoors and nature? And what do you do with that? Right? And so government, you know, NGOs, you're looking at how from interns, uh, interns all the way to the board leadership, you know, you can go from 22%, but your board is only between 4 and 5%. Government agencies pretty much mirrors that. Uh, foundations. A little better, but similar in, ter in terms of the representation, uh, it's not high enough. Oops. And this was one of the most, um, I think, interesting and key findings. When they're looking at external and internal, in other words, external is how do you get, how do you reach out, how are you more relevant, how do you get people in? That's the diversity question versus internal, which is in the inclusion. How do you keep people, right? So you get someone hired. Do they want to stay there? Is the culture supportive um, of these leaders? And the gap here is, you look on, on the left-hand side over there, green is that it should be done. Basically saying, is this important? Do you think we should do it? The other color is likely or very likely to support it. In other words, will you take a responsibility to do something about it? 
And so when we're looking at something like, hey, we should develop a pipeline for greater inclusion of minority and low-income residents in the activities, workforce or boards uh, like yours, do you think we should do that? 74% like, of NGOs said, yeah, we should do that. Now, do you think within your organization it will likely uh, be supported? Only about, what is that, 50% said so. So that gap, right? Similar for government agencies and foundations. Right? Something like, should we create a web portal for identifying ethnic minority environmental professionals for jobs? 67, 52, 80% said, yeah, it should be done. But then again, you notice that difference between will it actually be supported? And you notice the stark difference in foundations, 80% down 27%. Internally, similar, it's like, should it be done versus will it likely or very likely be supported? Should we hold a diversity training and staff meetings? I think that often becomes a, a key question in organizations. You look at you know, NGOs, 45% say, yeah, it should be done. But only 36% say, we'll actually support it. Um, should we organize a workshop on diversity? You see that gap. Government agencies are a little better, but that gap in action or inaction is one of the key findings that then said, well, what are you going to do about it? So the recommendations that this report came out with saying, well, here's some action for you to take. Right? The recommendations comes from the report, but also from leaders within the field saying, this is what we see working, this is what we don't see working. Six of them. Number one, adequate and stable funding. When you actually think about, quote unquote, diversity as a line item, as uh, Frank Peterman likes to say, Unless there's money behind it, it's not going to get done, right? Versus just, that's the question. People are like, we should do it. Do you actually allocate resources for it? Two, adequate and committed leadership. Again, it's a great idea, but do you have your board, do you have your executive director saying, we should do it and this is how we are going to do it? Right? And then the follow-up is, this is how we did it. And this is what we learned from it. Too many people get stuck and it's like, yeah, we, should, we should do it. We should find a way to do it. We don't know how to do it. Okay, well, let's um, appoint some people to figure out how to do it. And you get stuck in that cycle instead, instead of like, we're going to do it. We're likely going to make mistakes. We're going to learn from it, but we're going to keep addressing that. You do this for all the other work, but all of a sudden when it comes to the question of diversity, equity, and inclusion, it feels challenging or different. Number three, adequate organizational buy-in. That's really hard because you're tackling a culture in your organization um, that some people are going to feel uncomfortable with. And that's why it's important for you to understand that the framing here isn't about shame on you, you're doing it wrong, you know, you just need to be replaced. That's usually what triggers people into thinking like, well, I don't want to deal with that question. Because anytime I enter that space, you get issues of privilege, of white guilt, things that don't make you feel good. On one end is too bad. You need to be uncomfortable because those are the spaces that a lot of um, other communities have been in. And the question isn't for you to stay there, but understand, all right, so then how do we address that? You see this in other fields. Everything we're, we're talking about right now with um, social justice, with law enforcement, for example, it isn't that that's just certainly new, but it's become a lot more visible. And you be, you're, un, you're beginning to understand the difference of how some communities have experienced something. And now the question is, how do you work together to address it? Right? Rather than just thinking, well, there's nothing I can do about it, or it's not our field's problem, it's not our organizational no mission to do. If you're looking for ways into how it, you should have inaction, that's part of the problem. Every sector, every field, and every individual has a responsibility for this, regardless of your background. Four is the ability to communicate across race, class, gender, and cultural lines. That's what I'm telling you. Simple as starting a dialogue and understanding you are going to make mistakes, but you have to have your intention be true. Five, institutionalizing diversity, equity, and inclusion goals. 
something as simple as does, does your organization have a mission statement around that? Are you stuck? Do you know, know how to do that? Do you need models? Do you need templates? Do you need help around that? Is it clear to you how in everything that you do as a program that is present? Because as soon as you isolate something, it's easier for it to, to not have any actual impact or effect on your work and organization. And you see this a lot of times with individuals. This is why we talk about the idea of tokenizing. We got our black or brown person. They're going to do the community engagement. That's their thing. Done. Are they going to be involved in, in the decision making or the dialogue around other areas fields? Well, no, because we got them to do just work with the people. Well, what about the leadership they already have to influence the other areas okay. and bringing more people to do that so that you can understand how to engage with difference because that's where the change happens and to understand that engaging with difference has value. You know this when it comes to ecological diversity. You know this. As I've often said, you don't go out there and say that it's a beautiful monoculture of a forest. Right? You like to see diversity in the natural space. Part of the problem is the trees aren't asking you questions. They're not talking back to you in that way, right? It's like, hey, I kind of notice your, um, your pref you prefer the aspens a lot more, don't you? Right? And you're like, well, what do you mean? Right? It's, it's, that's what I mean about trying to understand that this isn't about um, just making you feel bad. And then you don't want to do anything about it. Because the stake of the work that we, I mean, the, the work that we do is what's at stake as well as the health and livelihood of our communities. And then last one is translate diversity training into action, which was what we said. So the recommendations come into these three areas, tracking and, trans and transparency, get your statements, but actually make sure you have a plan and data behind them. Accountability is that you have performance evaluation and you actually put it into, for example, grant making cr criteria something that California Relief has been, has been working on. Um, and resources, increased resources must be allocated for diversity initiatives to work, uh, and the funding. So what Green 2.0, um, you can actually just go Diverse Green or Green 2.0, read the whole report, see all of the information that's on there. The working group behind it um, started with a simple call to action, which is to ask as many conservation organizations um, as possible, sign on to make your data available. Because it starts with that transparency and information. Are you at 3%, 10%, 32%, 70%? Because that gives you a starting point. It isn't about shaming. It's about saying, this is where we are. So how do, what do we do about it? The Department of Interior um, you know, has all this data and information. But it was difficult for them to actually be able to say, you know, the Secretary of the Interior herself said, I was asking for numbers. I need to know where we are. And she said, um, this was just a week or two ago, she said, I, I looked at the numbers and it was um, very disheartening. We made no progress, under 1%. And she said, the, the optimism I have, though, is that now we've actually begun to put mechanisms and structures in place and people um, to see where we're going to go. Because you couldn't just hide behind, well, yeah, we, we don't know what the numbers are, or it's difficult, or we don't really have an uh, you know, appointed person or allocated resource for that. And that was the difference between saying, well, are you doing these things? And the second thing that Green 2.0 has asked is pairing with uh, GuideStar, GuideStar to now make that part of, of the requirement. Show what is the, the diversity percentage of your organization. Because then the other push right now is now with funders to be able to say, all right, funders, how does your funding uh, look like in terms of where does it go and how it supports uh, or organizations of color, but also um, a lot of the work that actually feeds into diversity? Because they've also realized that that's, it's the same. So that's where the Green 2.0 working group is right now. They're, they're coming up with uh, more information. They're getting a lot of organizations to sign on. I would ask you that if you have not heard about this, go read it, look at it, sign on, and say, I 
commit our organization, or even if you're not the decision maker, go to your decision makers and say, this is what's going, this is, the, this is what's happening. Because the push is going to be that um, if we're serious about this and all the funders continue to sign on, uh, you need to do it. And that shouldn't feel like just a stick, but rather for me, my question and push to you is this. If your mission statement is accurate in that in some way you're trying to say we're here to serve the community of, um, that word community, how is it reflective? Because otherwise, you need to go and change your mission statement to say we are here to, own, to serve the, only the people blank in this community because that's really what you're doing. And then the second challenge for that is to be able to say, if we are working with a community, do we have, are we working with them in such a way that we're not limiting them as objects of programming, like we're just serving them, but rather do we feel that we're providing uh, support and capacity so that leadership capacity uh, is gonna move up? So that you're thinking about your own transition as well, but you're also making it very clear that ultimately, um, 2042, 2050, uh, the decision-making spaces are going to look different, and you want to leave the work that you're doing in the best hands possible because we want to continue to build on those conservation successes. And if we don't do that, we're going to have this conversation again in 20, 30, 40, 50 years. But guess what? Our, our time lighters are getting shorter and shorter and shorter because um, the demographics are not going back. So I will, oops, there we go. I'll pause there because I don't want it to keep it pithy. I can answer a few more questions about the report, but um, I really wanted to stress that point to be able to say, this is a resource for you. Go look at what it says, read it. The whole idea is to be able to have data behind it so you can understand what actions you can take. Okay? So I'll, I'll stop there. Any questions? Is it on? Okay. So we have to start somewhere, right? So I know we should immerse ourselves in the communities that we're wanting to work with, um, but in many cases here, there are only so many staff members or people on the board who can, you know, and who in many cases are all volunteers or mostly volunteers. So, I mean, do you have some some advice for us as to how what a what a you know a starting point would be? you know, mm -hmm. where we would feel like we're working with integrity towards the goal of having a more diverse organization, but we can't do it all at right. once. I mean, it's probably a five-year journey, or it, it's a journey. It is definitely a journey. You're not going to change this overnight. Uh, and don't beat yourself up over it to try to change it overnight, because you're dealing with the work that has that struggled for 30-plus years. We had an opportunity to address this back in the early 1990s when environmental justice organizations came to the big green orgs and said, let's work together, or you're kind of not helping us, so get out of the way. Uh, the big green orgs could afford to not work together because they could still rely on a constituency that was giving them success. Um, that's been changing over the past five, ten years. Um, so start with discrete, measurable goals. You look at your board, can we actually get you know, one additional board member that we feel addresses this? That it's, can we get one more diverse board member? And are we clear that when we're inviting that board member, it isn't to just feel, check, we got it. It isn't a checklist, but are we then able to go ahead and um, call that a success? You look at your, if you're a grant maker, do we have any grants in which we were actually asking who were giving funding that question? Like, do we know? 
if you are receiving funding, you might get asked and in anticipating uh, what you may get asked, do you already know what are the demographics of your community? A lot of times you do, but then be able to say, now do we know how we're allocating the resources for that? Second thing is also, do, can, are we able to get an additional staff member? Or if you're not getting staff members and volunteers, then say, okay, how many volunteers can we get from diverse communities? And are we able to do that? Why or why not? And that can be simple in terms of measurable. You're not going to go out there and say, look at us from January to December, we became the more diverse, the most diverse inclusive organization in our sector. Because um, that's not, um, how would I put it? It's, it's not sustainable, but you're setting yourself up to fail. And then that's going to make you feel worse and feel bad and say, well, great, there's no point in doing this. And then lastly is, under, this is the harder part, if you have no basis for feeling comfortable or understanding even this conversation or topic or field, then start with that and say, what is the standard diversity, equity, and inclusion training? How would that look like for us in our field? Are there leaders of color that can provide that? The answer is yes. Are there consultants? In the same way that you address any other issue, you find consultants like that. Right? You find resources quickly. Treat this similarly, but understanding that the people factor is really crucial. Right? And then lastly is understand through that training, I would say, be okay with acknowledging the privilege that you have. And I say privilege not to treat that completely bad or wrong. I have privilege as a Latino male that Latina males are not going to have or other communities are not going to have. At the same time, I don't have privileges that a white male would have. Um, or when we look same thing for gender, for example. And then understand, great, what does that afford me in terms of a limitation that then I can ask for help? But what does that afford me as an asset that I know I, I can help? Guess what? If I am a white male, that means that other white males will likely listen to me more than the person of color. So if you are serious about being an ally, then you do that. Okay? That's important because you also don't want to limit leaders of colors as they are going to teach us all and everything. Right? You have a responsibility as well if, if you're not a person of color. And so those little pieces are important. And I will actually put California Relief on the spot in a good way because I think you should ask the board and Cindy how that journey has been. Uh, and I, I appreciate her honesty and transparency of saying, here's where we are, and here's where we'd like to be, and we need help in how to get there. And then being able to say, this is what we did. Um, because that's, that's really important so that others can, can see that. Any other questions? Hmm? And of course, I also welcome opinions, editorials, and critiques. So. <laughs> So, Jose, I have applied for a number of jobs through my life and not received a callback. Just FYI. Mm -hmm. So I'm not sure. I don't know how much that has to do with the person's name. My name is spelled strangely. You're but a woman. I am, and I'm a woman, yeah. yeah. So, and I'm a blonde. <laughs> but I know there's truth in what you're saying, but I, I think a lot of companies don't call people back. Mm -hmm. That's just rude. Yeah, and I understand that. I just say like the irony of having them contact me for the very yeah. same thing I applied to. If I never heard from them again, I could be like, all right, cool, it just wasn't a fit. But, and they're still asking for help. And we now have established some relationships, but now they know the truth. Um, I'm sorry, Oscar? Thank you. Um, when I was teaching uh, Arbor Culture at LA City College, I did it first in English, and then I decided to do it in Spanish and to address, you know, to show Spanish speakers uh, some of the Arbor Culture practices that we have. Um, in doing so, I actually had to go to the dictionary and look for words to translate that are so 
distinct in arboriculture, and I learned from teaching, you know, in Spanish. I learned a lot of words. So I think uh, with diversity, we could all learn too, and it's like a win-win situation. Thank mm -hmm. you. Mm -hmm. <laughs> Snap. Hi, my name is Vanessa Torres. I um, work with Santa Monica Mountains National Recreation Area. I'm the LA District Supervisor just down here, a couple doors down. Um, and, and one thing I just wanted to add um, to Jose's wonderful talk is that a lot of times when we do mention people of color or diverse communities, we automatically uh, go to uh, poor people, that, that people of color equate to poor people. And that simply is not true. Uh, Latinos themselves have a, um, and correct me if I'm wrong, a $3.7 trillion buying Purchase power okay. and African Americans at $3.5 trillion, trillion with a T. And so just think about that as well as we continue to check our privilege and reach out to these communities that not all people of color are poor people. Mm -hmm. Cool, thank you. And that's really important when you think about assets versus, versus deficiency. I just wanna thank Jose, before I let you show applause. Uh, Jose just has taught us an awful lot of things, and, and this is uncomfortable, and it's been very helpful to have his thoughtful, graceful handling of this as we were working through it. So he was a treasure that Catherine Martineau uh, introduced to us, and we, when we had cultural competency training last year um, at California Relief, um, and in talking about resources to take those discrete steps about learning things, you know, relief is supposed to be a resource. And one of the, a couple of the resources that I can mention to you right now is that um, Jose did a bunch of talks for the National Association for Interpretation and uh, three of them on cultural competency. And we gained access to those. They're normally for members only. We gained access to those. And you can go to the relief website. You can go under webinars or education and you'll find those three trainings on there if you want to learn more and then also yesterday, at the Relief Retreat, which is for the network members, the nonprofits, we did something kind of based on our conversations happening, which is where we had Leo Buck, who's the co-executive director of Common Vision, give a talk on racial justice. And Leo was literally doing it from the perspective of a white man talking about how he had been, um, uh, how, what he had learned over the last eight years because he had taken a bus with a a bunch load of volunteers to go plant trees in disadvantaged communities and long ago realized that they needed to understand better the community that they were working in. So that thing, that, that, that two hour session that we had yesterday, that will also be, uh, all of these things are being videotaped and, and they will be on our website afterwards. Um, so you can also watch what Leo's perspective was, because Leo literally was using the term racial justice. You know, he was saying, okay, and that's where he talked more about privilege, et cetera. So, mm -hmm. so but thank you very, okay. very much. Yeah. I will um, do a one quick closing thought. Um, for the, regardless of where you are in your organization, because a lot of times you think, well, I'm not the ED, or I'm not the program supervisor, or I'm just the volunteer. Um, Give yourself that concrete, measurable goal, even if it's something just for you, just for yourself, and say, by next week, by next month, by mid-year, I will. You know you do this with your SMART goals and everything else for all programs. Just do it for yourself here and say, I will be able to comfortably have a conversation around da-da-da-da, or I will be able to um, you know, understand the the, the terminology and language in this field, or I will meet with a different uh, leader that's a you know, person of color, or I will make sure that I will reach out to an additional organization and I will think about what resources I can offer and think about how we can collaborate together. That some of that I know you already know, but it goes back to the gap, right? Yes, it should be done, versus how likely, is it likely or very likely to be supported? And the support comes from you. So just close with that. Uh, I'm here to be at your service, but understand I'm not proclaiming all um, you know, knowledge and everything. We are tapped as it, as it is with resources, but we would love to be able to connect you with a lot of other, other wonderful individuals that, that genuinely want to support you in doing this work. So thank you. <laughs>